Thanks. The problem that happens when you speak towards the end is most of the points have already been covered. The risk, rewards, everything almost have been covered, but still I will try to give a bit different perspective. So we were talking about customers, EPC contractor, developers. So let's not look at these things as shareholders. Uh, let's not look at their shareholders as one of the element. We also no need to look at in any of the bid or any of the transaction. All these are stakeholders. One of these cannot win. All of them have to win to make the project successful. That's the key. So if all three of them can work in tan tandem, then things can move in the right direction. We have been talking about risk and reward. Pricing is just one part of it. There are a lot of other elements. There are a lot of other risks that developer is taking, EPC contractor is taking, supplier is taking. If those risks are addressed properly through a better contract, trying to mitigate those risks, for a very simple example, if there is a if there's somewhere there is a clause that, okay, you can delay the project by three months, six months for X, Y, Z reason, if those things are allowed or if the project is not de delayed, if some other measures can be taken so that no one is suffering in this entire gamut of stakeholders, in that case, I believe the challenges can be mitigated, can be mitigated to a significant extent. And as I believe that the market always finds its own level. It's always a supply-demand game. If the risks are not mitigated, the capacity would be lower in the market. So again, EPC contractor will be pushed to decrease the prices and developers will be pushed to decrease the prices. So things will go on like this. So I believe things will find its own level on basis of demand and supply. Well, um, I mean, it's absolutely natural that we see uh, such challenges uh, when we see the numbers. A uh, few years ago, we were a few gigawatt per year. Now we are 300 gigawatt, and we are supposed to go to one terawatt uh, per year in 2030. Uh, so for sure, there will be a lot of uh, adaptation in the supply and in the regulatory framework. And so the, the way to address all that it's maybe not let market forces just play the role, but also have some uh, re new regulatory framework. So that's what we see, for example, in the supply chain uh, with COVID and so on. Uh, many governments now they want to relocate their uh, industry, part of the industry, uh, either uh, raw material or processing raw material. Uh, so you, you can see that in the US, but also in India, actually. Uh, in India now, uh, uh, they, they, they want to produce a cell, but also wafer. Uh, soon. Uh, and that's why you have a tax, uh, an import tax, and so it will increase uh, momentarily uh, the, the prices. So it's not only because of the shortage, but also because the, the supply chain may change a bit. Uh, and then, uh, but, but it's not only the cost of raw material, you have also efficiency and so on. So module manufacturers, for example, today, they are trying to increase as much as possible the efficiency so that the cost of the balance of plant is less and then you have uh, 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 even lower uh, LCOE, despite having raw material, which are more costly. Well, that's not the case today. <laughs> I, know, I understand, but that's, that, that's the idea. So then, then on the price, uh, well, solar is the cheapest um, uh, way to produce uh, electricity ever uh, in our industrial uh, history. Um, and so, well, if uh, it increases by 20% or 30%, uh, so be it. Uh, it may slow down the energy transition, uh, but as you can see, for example, in India, uh, we are still, despite the tax and so on, we are still uh, below uh, the cost of uh, coal, actually, to produce coal. Uh, and even, actually, the 24-7 uh, uh, project with battery and solar, we are reaching very uh, competitive prices. So I believe that um, although prices have increased, uh, still, the, the forces behind the energy transition are still uh, very strong. Thank you. So what we understand is, you know, definitely this is going to stay for a while. What it requires is, you know, the customer should understand uh, the reality of the situation, what's, what's happening in the market, because it's not only the developers or the, you know, EPC contractors or, uh, you know, uh, 
the part of the company it's also them who are also facing this in their own operations and they have to understand that and the most important part is since uh, as we discussed that it's going to be one <coughs> one you know uh, we have 300 gigawatt per per year right now yeah, so 300. From 300, we are going to be 1,000. So that means a lot of talent migration would also happen. Talent development will happen. So we have a lot of people who can utilize this opportunity to move into, you know, these companies and help them out with their own challenges. So this takes me to very uh, precise question to especially the developers right now who are sitting with me on the stage. Uh, we have from both the side distributed and utility. So I would like to have your thoughts on, you know, you have distributed, you have utility scale operating in the same market. So how is the coexistence of, you know, these two distributed and utility are helping each other or is there a competition that you see in each other? How, how is it, you know, you see uh, distributed and utility co coexisting together? So I would start with uh, Mr. Ashok, if you can spare some thoughts on that. Sure, look, uh, I firmly, being in the distributed generation space, that distributed generation needs its place in the sun. The way I see it is utility covers a very large scale of operation, while you have the rooftops here, the small areas here, which need to be addressed. So definitely, if you take any figure less than 10 megawatt, there needs to be some players who are addressing that space. Utility alone may not be able to fill the gap for the net zero targets we have in place. And we are seeing so far in the evolution of uh, Dubai and UAE that both of them together can contribute substantially. So my view is that the distributed generation needs a special space and it is not in competition with the utility scale. So what it means is the regulatory bodies, the policy making bodies will have to think of what are the individual challenges faced by each sector and then look at them. Some things like, you know, ensuring that uh, policy restrictions do not uh, hobble a sector is important in this context. Just to elaborate on that, I would l also like to ask that, you know, since utility covers a lot more ground than uh, what distributed does, so how the net zero targets, you know, how, how the impact on net zero target can be, you know, substantially contributed by uh, distributed players in this case? Uh, if you see, one is like I told you, the rooftops, car parks and the ground mounted systems, but you start looking at say e-mobility, you have electric vehicles. Now on-site generation makes more sense in these sort of scenarios. So as we go along five, ten years down the line, it will become decentralized generation will become important. If you look at say the consumer engagement, a utility, it's a limited engagement for the consumer. While you take distributed generation, all clients, you know, Putting up a solar system on your roof gives you energy independence, energy security, and a control over the energy supply. So I think this trend will accelerate as we go into the future. Thank you, Mr. Ashok. Mr. Antonio, I believe EDF uh, also ventured into small-scale projects, uh, partnering with uh, Mazda. So what, what would be your thoughts on, you know, because now you have both the divisions uh, distributed and utility which are working, how are they working under the same umbrella or how, how you know, the whole thought is about this? Well, I, I think uh, there should be a collaboration between, between both. Uh, uh, right now, um, uh, it's well known that, for instance, EDF is involved in the, uh, the, the the one largest utility project in the world located in, in, in Abu Dhabi, Al Dafra PV project, along with our partners, uh, Jinko, Taka, and Master. So that means that we are going to inject to the grid uh, 2.1 gigawatt uh, in the near future. So, um, yeah, uh, so it's, let's say this, that uh, this is going to be our um, uh, battery limit. So we need distributed company to work along with, with us because. As uh, we discussed before, if we, we don't have uh, a commodity grid in the countries, uh, uh, I think it's not valuable, uh, valuable our, our projects. Uh, Mr. Rumain, you would have thoughts because you know you have 80 members in MISIA, so you would also be talking to you know utility and distributed scale players. So you know there would be thoughts 
around this you know coexistence of distributed and uh, utility scale <coughs> so um yeah here my colleague have discussed more on the developer sides uh maybe you know when you look at distributed energy um if you look from the i would say the the, oper the grid operator utility side uh, i fully agree with uh, ashok that uh, both utility scale and distributed should be uh, developed at a quicker pace than is done today because we are falling behind to to reach the, the net zero targets uh, just if we talk about net zero targets you know uh, here in uae the, the clean energy strategy is 44 percent of renewable by 2050 with a grid roughly that should be around 100 giga so around 44 giga maybe mostly so uh, mostly solar uh, right now we are i think 500 megawatt on distributed so it's less than two percent on what we need to be on the total solar uh, in 2050 so there's a lot of rooms and this should not be filled only by utility scale. Uh, so both of them should, should be developed at a quicker pace. When you look at utility, I think, you know, uh, distributed energy, they, they, they pose some challenge that needs to be tackled to unlock uh, a fast development. Uh, on, the, on the grid operator side, there's challenge on uh, planning, uh, revenue modeling, uh, interconnection, regulation as well. Uh, that needs to be uh, tackled to, uh, to, uh, to unlock uh, a quicker pace. Um, when you see that there's an increasing number of customers that goes into uh, solar energy in their home, on their roof, or on the business, there's as well a cost model from utility that is more complicated. Um, the utilities, they, they don't control the, the demands, and in that case, they don't control the supply. Uh, behind the meter. Uh, for utility scale, you've got a big scale, transmission grids, uh, regional transmission that have a planning, you, they know how much you will produce and so on. On utility scale, it's different. Uh, they don't really know what will be supplied behind the meter, and it poses some challenges for them. On top of those challenges, uh, there's uh, less revenue for utilities because uh, obviously, when customers are reducing their dependency, uh, it's good for them, there's energy security and so on, but it's less revenue to the utility, but the utility still to spend costs to maintain generation capacity, transmission, distribution line. So here, I think to go quicker on the developments, uh, the regulation should set uh, a new model that fits for both the utility players and the, and the developer on the CNI. Uh, so, um, so at the end, uh, both on the cost sides, uh, the technology should bring something on the planning and so on with smart meters and so on. And once we will fit, we will, uh, I will say, improve those. I think you know the the pace will be faster. But uh, still, there need to be a lot of work on, on regulation right now, I believe. Thank you. So now uh, I come to the next question to Mr. Mustafa. Uh, that, you know, we would also like to understand, since you know you have been expert on advisor and uh, on clean energy, that what, how can the local manufacturing supply chain can help you know the developers and the EPC contractors to make it you know the the whole process or the experience more efficient. You know, or, or more, you know, as a customer delight. How can we do that? That's a very uh, uh, good uh, question because uh, no, local manufacturing is, uh, is a big issue and, and you know, uh, worldwide. I, I think uh, for, for the region, I think uh, it's one, one of the priorities to, to uh, secure, you know, a minimum of, uh, of equipment for those very big projects because with those uh, regional issues, you know, those uh, lockdowns, and uh, we, we cannot wait uh, for uh, uh, having, you know, those equipment to, uh, to manage our, um, to implement our project. Otherwise, otherwise, as you know, the, the electricity sector is very sensitive, and any delay for one or two years in implementing those projects, maybe the utility will, will shift 
uh, their uh, their targets and uh, will go back to the the oil <laughs> uh, uh, solutions and that is very serious because uh, uh, I think even for the the despite parts it was I think uh, mentioned in one of the conferences that uh, you know uh, with the lockdown it was uh, uh, you know a, a, a project a very big project in the region was uh, delayed for for those for those uh, small re reasons I, I don't know why but it was I think uh, the, the problem for transportation that is I think for uh, for lo local manufacturing I uh, I just have to mention the, the Saudi uh, business model. They launch, you know, this uh, uh, kind of policy framework uh, integrating local manufacturing in, in the project. And uh, now, with this minimum for uh, any technology they uh, set up, you know, a minimum of integration uh, starting by 50% of local manufacturing because even for the electrical cable, as I, I even mentioned in my, uh, in the 90s, the, 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 the manufacturer, the developers were saying that uh, it is very specific, you know, cable that uh, we have to import it from, 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 from abroad. And it was, uh, it was you know, a, 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 a lie. Uh, and uh, now, I think uh, uh, UAE particularly, they are going with uh, this industry, you know, uh, uh, strategy uh, with, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, uh, partnership with uh, the Saudi, with Egypt, with Jordan. I think they signed uh, recently, you know, a, a cooperation framework. And this is one step forward for uh, regional integration, including the clean energy technologies. So that is, I think, uh, uh, for the supply uh, chain uh, point of view, I think it's very important to have, you know, uh, a minimum of uh, uh, products, you know, in the region. Uh, I don't know, it's, uh, maybe we can attract, you know, uh, the, 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 the manufacturer from uh, outside to be uh, uh, present in the region. Uh, I didn't mention that we have to invent something new, <laughs> but we have, uh, maybe we have to invent GA solar or first solar to come invest. That is, I think, one of those cycles is to you know, uh, have, uh, you know, um, a favorable uh, environment, you know, uh, uh, investment, you know, framework that I think uh, uh, the, the authorities can implement uh, easily. And uh, you have just to show them that you have a, a, a very serious you know, strategy, you have a clear vision, you have, uh, you know, uh, uh, targets, that is, I think, one of the questions that uh, you have mentioned previously uh, regarding the cost. The cost is not, not depend only on the, on the supply chain. The, 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 the cost is also directly linked to the policy and the, the risk that the country have. So the, the, if the country minimizes those risks, you know, with a clear and flexible policy, with, you know, a clear target and uh, I don't, I, I don't think that we can go beyond that, the target and policy is enough, and that can also uh, attract investor and reduce also the cost, and reduce all those, so those all uh, risks related to the supply chain. Mr. Dinesh, you would have any views on this? Uh, with regards to uh, what uh, my colleague said is uh, good, but uh, since the project capacity is going bigger and much larger, whereas the construction duration remains the same, like 18 months, 20 months for gigawatt style uh, project, getting material from outside the country also has a lot of issues with reference to logistics, shipping constraints, getting custom clearance. Rather, manufacturing is locally, if you can, get it at the same cost will really be supporting the project. At least you can save two to three months of uh, your construction time which gives a lot of liberty, uh, like uh, in-country localization, it creates more employment in the country as well. So you reduce, you can produce at much better price, faster price, faster projects. Things are working out on that front from the government policy matters as well. Thank you. Uh, Manish, you would have any thoughts on this? For an for any local manufacturing to develop, I think there are a few basics which 
Any nation, if they satisfy, it will pick up. The first is the local capacity that you create for them. Second is the cost structure. You need to be cognizant of the fact that there are X countries who can produce cheaper than you. So what is the value that you are adding? And how do you provide the initial shield to the manufacturers or the assemblers so that they can they have some time available at hand by which they can bring, uh, they can come back and compete with the world. So as far as I understand, UAE, if you look at the overall local capacity, uh, the manufacturing seems to be a challenge until the local uh, capacity gets developed. And then it all depends upon the free trade agreements which UAE is going to enter with various countries. And it's very recently UAE has entered into a free trade agreement with India, which means anything that manufactured in UAE can be freely exported to uh, India. So a lot many factors play a, a crucial role in the decision making. But looking at the cost structure, except for the labor cost, I think the cost of finance, the cost of infrastructure setup, cost of energy, they all play in favor of uh, UAE. Thank you. So what we understand is, you know, one of the strategies to, you know, have that cost competitiveness is to have a local manufacturing supply chain and making sure that there are internal capacities to consume, uh, you know, from these supply chains. And definitely, you know, we touched upon regional cooperation and stakeholders management which is, you know, one of the very critical uh, part of, you know, this whole process. Now, I would ha have very, you know, pertinent question to Manish Yu that, you know, you are in project financing. So, how, how the project financing, you know, is getting impacted because, you know, of all the vo volatility and geopolitical crisis and interest rates going up and since, you know, there is a pressure on cost and tariff expectation, how are you managing on that aspect? Sleepless nights, <laughs> in couple of words. But jokes apart, in finance it's pretty straightforward. If your risk goes up, your returns should go up. So that's what we are always looking for. We are trying to find the best time to swap our interest rates. We are trying to optimize taxes as much as possible wherever those are apt applicable. We are taking different inputs from different lenders. What are the best practices? What is the kind of structure that lend lenders are looking at? If previously we were reaching out to four lenders, we are reaching out to seven, eight lend lenders right now to understand what is the risk appetite for them. So these are few of the things that we are taking in a into account as of now. And we are trying to squeeze every bit of cash flows that we have possibly in the project so that we can improvise the returns for different stakeholders. But as you said, uh, how is it possible to manage those risks? In short, term, this, uh, in short term, we are getting affected, but if you look at the interest rate curve, it's inverted curve for US Treasury market. That means in the short term, the rates are going up, it's more than 300 bips, but in long term, those rates are mo below 200 uh, 70, 80 bips. So it's in inverted and so long term perspective remains good and we remain hopeful that things will get better with time. One more thing that I can add is that when, when, whenever the risk comes, the opportunity also follows. So you have to just look at different doors. A lot of DFIs are providing concessional financings because of logistic issues. You try to tap into those pockets to improvise the returns of the projects. So if I could summarize taxes, reaching out to more lenders, con concessional financing, these are three to four items that we see in the short term that will help the project. In the long term, things will be fine. Mr. Kareem, your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, well, I'm, I'm more on the, on the equity side, uh, but uh, yeah, clearly the impact of uh, uh, the, um, the margin and uh, the rates uh, getting higher, for sure the LCOE is getting higher. Uh, that being said, again, uh, uh, you know, an increase of 20% of the LCOE, for example, in the MENA region, uh, if it's uh, uh, $10 uh, per megawatt hour, then it's 12 or 13. 
uh, were still very cheap. And uh, we have also to have in mind that uh, we are subsidizing uh, fossil fuel by trillions of dollars uh, all the time. So, you know, the competitivity is, is a bit uh, uh, different. Um, so, um, on the equity side, I mean, you know, develop, what we see is that developers, they are uh, trying to be as, uh, you know, as innovative as ever. Uh, so, you do have, for example, in India, um, uh, uh, platforms that are going in the, in the bond market. Uh, they're trying to modify the repayment profile um, and so to generate more dividends and to absorb uh, part of the uh, extra cost. Um, you know, there's no, not much uh, uh, to do. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's... Uh <laughs> are you also looking that uh, this UAE market is, you know, they will have a lot of consolidation in terms of, you know, acquisitions of projects uh, for, from someone well, like uh, you or no, developers? Uh, again, we're not really working here because, um, I mean, the, the, the large developers, they, they don't really use uh, such a platform uh, to sell a 15% or 20% share uh, in a very large, uh, very large uh, project. I think financial advisors, they are, more, uh, they are well equipped for that. Uh, rather than going to, to a platform. Uh, so, well, concentration is, uh, uh, you know, assets, they are always in the market. Uh, so, M &A, the M&A market is, is very big, actually, in renewable energy. You have maybe uh, 5,000 transactions uh, per year um, and very large transactions. Uh, that's why, actually, we are positioning ourselves in this, uh, in this market. We believe that there are different uh, uh, type of services. You have financial advisors, but also platform, uh, origination platform can, uh, can play a role for a uh, different um, uh, type of transaction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Antonio, I have a question for you on, uh, you know, since on uh, Al Dafra PV2 project, I believe you would be also participating in that and Manish, uh, I would, you know, have a thought from you as well. So, you know, uh, as, you know, one of the major developers and one of the biggest developers in the utility, uh, how do you see Al Dafra PV2, you know, setting up a new benchmark uh, for Dubai, for UAE, sorry. Yeah, thank you for, for, the, for the question. Well, um, um, those who, who are working as a developer or a PC contractor uh, really know what's uh, happened with the, with the prices over the last uh, two years, uh, which uh, uh, has been impacting in the projects and their execution or those who already signed the, the, the PPA and reached the financial close. So there, there, there was a clear impact on, on our project in Aldafra. Uh, but uh, what is important for, for us as, as developer is to, um, to be in a position to deliver uh, energy, clean energy in the, in the region. So we are uh, working very hard uh, doing a lot of efforts uh, along with our stakeholders and the APC contractors uh, to make the project uh, a real success uh, during 2023. So um, now we are in a position that uh, we can say that uh, we have purchased 100% of the modules in the market, despite the, 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 the problem we, we face uh, with pricing. Uh, project is it's under execution with uh, an electrical substation 400 kV uh, almost uh, commissioning, so we'll be in a position to uh, energize the, the electrical substation uh, mid-October 2022. From that moment onwards, uh, our intention is to start uh, producing energy. So we have around 100 megawatts already installed on site. Uh, so the problem, the, the project is, is uh, it's moving forward uh, really well, and I think we are so confident that we, we can achieve the, the project commercial operation date uh, as Q2 of 2023. 